Right. So before we continue with the video, I want to show you more examples. I think that's really beneficial. Uh, there are a few things I want to uh, tell you before we continue with the video. Uh, first of all, any questions up to this point? Okay, so I just want to briefly tell you a few things. One is, um, you know, we looked at uh, airplanes and we said if this is the back, you know, you have the, the vertical tail and then you have the horizontal tail, right? It looks like this. And then there was a case where we have seen in the videos where you have the T-tail, right? And I told you that, you know, structurally this point and this point is not easy because you have this huge structure that is sitting on top of the, w of the, of the airplane. And these points here, they really have to be very strong. Plus you have the vibration coming from this in all sorts of directions and you might really have a nice vibration problem and a nice aeroelastic problem with your T-tail. So this becomes, became kind of the standard in most commercial airplanes, okay? This is what we call the T-tail, okay? And then this is the conventional one with the vertical fin and the horizontal tail, okay? So there's one more you might have seen in fighters that look like this. Did you see those? We call it the V-tail, because it looks like a V. And if you look at, uh, at, at this thing from the side, it kind of looks like this. Right? It looks like that, and it actually has one surface over here. Okay? And this acts like a horizontal tail and a vertical tail. It kind of does both at the same time. So how is that possible? Well, it's using that differential element, okay? So if both of these, both of these control surfaces move in one direction, what do you get? You get a moment, you get a pitching moment as well as a yawing moment, right? You see that? Let me make it a little bit more obvious. Let's say they are like this. Okay? And let's say I move both of them in this direction. What do I get? Right? One is moving in one direction. You know, if you look from the side or from the, I don't know how to plot this the best. Um, if you have this, you get one force that looks like this and you get another force that looks like this. So you have all sorts of moments. If you would move it like this, you might get one source over here one would be this way, okay? And if you look at these two components, these two would cancel, these two would cancel, but you would have a net force that goes up this way. You see? So it would be kind of a differential in order to act like a horizontal tail. And this would definitely give you a yawing moment, but it would also give you a roll. And you have to compensate this with your ailerons and do other things. So what I'm trying to say, if you have a V-tail, that will, that can be used both as a horizontal tail or as well as a vertical tail, but it will cancel forces in order to have a pure pitch-up moment, for example. So cancelling forces is not something we really like because it's a little bit inefficient. You're generating a force and then you're generating another force and you cancel them. Not good, right? So, and you have that little force here that will give you the pitch up moment. 
which, might, which means you really need big retails in order to have that pitch up moment. But imagine an airplane that in the pitching direction is not very stable. In other words, let's say the static margin is not big. The static margin is small. If the static margin is small, which means a little push will immediately make it pull, pull up. Right? So you maybe not need that big of a moment at the back. So then my, you might want to have a V-tail and these little forces that allow you immediately to give a pitch up or a pitch down, even though you cancel a lot of those forces. Okay? So a V-tail always looks good and cool, but you have to be careful because you are canceling forces in order to generate a pitch up or a pitch down or, or even a yawing moment. So canceling forces means that you need maybe double the size of a horizontal tail in order to achieve the same pitching moment, pitch up moment. But again, maybe you don't need a big pitch up moment because it is the, 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 the static margin is already very small and the little push already gives you a lot of moment. So these are all calculations that you have to make if you want to really have a vertical, uh, a V-tail like that, okay? Another question I, I, I sometimes get is, there are airplanes that look like this, the delta wings. Have you seen them? I'm, I'm sure, it's, it's a bad delta wing now. With a CG here in the front. And you have seen these delta wings. They don't really have a horizontal tail per se, right? And they don't really have a, they sometimes have a vertical tail. They have a V-tail, but not really a horizontal tail. So how do you get CM0 to be positive, right? Because if you look at the, this wing, it is actually, a, uh, it looks more like an airfoil. So how do you do that? In order to get CM0 positive, what they do is they just twist they just twist the whole wing. So if you look at this, this wing, this, this, the, the delta wing, sorry, the whole wing is twisted in such a way that CM0 is still positive, which means you have a positive pitch up moment when alpha is equal to zero. In order to get a positive pitch up moment when alpha is equal to zero, you really need more angle of attack here, less angle of attack here, so that's only possible if you take the wing and twist it, okay? So the delta wing, it looks really straight, but it, it, it is twisted somehow that you still have CM0 positive if you want to have a stable uh, delta wing airplane. So you can do a lot of tricks, okay? Or you could have a, actually an unstable aircraft and have the, 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 the horizontal tail at the back, or the, the control surfaces work a lot to stabilize the system, which is in fact unstable. I mean, look at, you know, remember the, the pendulum? This is a stable equilibrium point, and this is an unstable equilibrium point? It doesn't mean that I cannot hold it like this. If I'm fast enough here, I could, I could probably hold it. I'm just not fast enough, right? The inverted pendulum, I, I could hold it like this. So you could hold this, uh, this equilibrium point. It doesn't mean that it, you cannot stay here. The control can actually hold it. So it's the same thing with airplanes. If the airplane is unstable, it doesn't mean that you cannot fly it. The control can still hold it, and the autopilot usually does that if it's a really unstable airplane. There are a lot of airplanes that cannot be flown with human pilots only. You definitely need an autopilot that will stabilize it because the system is unstable. I mean, the equilibrium point is unstable. So you need the ailerons and the elevator and the horizontal tail control to work a lot in order to stabilize the airplane, okay? Can you fly it? Yes. The autopilot stabilizes it. Is the equilibrium point unstable? Yes. No controls, the airplane would just go like that. But the controls, they help, not help only, they actually maintain that equilibrium point through the control system. Understood? So how do you do it? You play with the ailerons, you play with the horizontal tail, vertical tail, and the airplane is trying to fly. In reality, if you leave your controls, it will go unstable. Same thing with helicopters. Helicopters are unstable in hover. You leave the controls there, a helicopter will probably be doing 
But the pilot is always correcting. It's always trying to do this. And if you have a good helicopter, you have an autopilot, you click the autopilot and the airplane, the helicopter stays in hover. The pilot is not doing anything, but you look at the controls, the controls are going like that in order to stabilize the aircraft. Very typical these days. Okay? So if you're interested in how to design these autopilots and these control systems, you need to take automatic control one, automatic control two, which are offered in this department, and you can learn how you design these control systems. Okay? So, what else? Any questions? Okay. So, finally, I want to tell you one more thing. You know, uh, there are a few things I wanted to tell you throughout the course, but I, uh, I kind of left it to the end because you need the whole picture. Uh, another thing I want to tell you is, for example, we talked about CM alpha, right? That is changing the moment because of alpha. What does that mean? It's, 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 it's like the more alpha I have, the more moment I have. You know, that kind of relationship. Or we talked about CL beta. The more beta I have, the more moment I have, right? That's, that's relationship. This one here is more like a stiffness now. So it's almost like this. Let's say you have an airplane. Let's talk about CM alpha, right? CM alpha is, this is alpha. The more alpha you have, the more moment you will have. The more alpha you have, the more alpha you have, the bigger moment you have. It's almost like a spring action. It almost looks like this, isn't it? Like this, like almost there is a spring attached and the bigger that alpha, the bigger the moment, isn't it? The bigger the spring, the bigger the force. So this is what we call a stiffness. This is an aerodynamic derivative that is related to the stiffness of the airplane. This is almost like a, a stiffness. Because it is really like a spring action. The more alpha, the more moment. The more alpha, the more moment. So it's like a spring. You see? It's like a spring. You know, we have this thing mass, and then you have a spring constant k. The bigger the, the x, the bigger the force, right? And that's a function of k, k is a stiffness. It's about the same thing. The more the alpha, the more the moment. So it's kind of the stiffness of the system. Now, what about CMQ, for example? Now, that's an interesting one, CMQ. CMQ is the moment that you are getting because of Q. Q is what? Angular rate. Yeah? Q is pitching, pitch rate, the angular velocity. So the moment because of Q. That means if Q is equal to zero, there's no Q, I mean, there's, if there's no pitch rate, then moment is equal to zero, right? But there's a moment because of alpha, of course, because of the stiffness. So this moment is because of the pitch rate, because of the angular velocity. So the more angular velocity, the more pitch rate. This is almost like a, if I make a duality between this, what does it look like? It's like a damping, right? That's, we have the same thing in the damping. Where is my, can't find my red pen, it's gone. <laughs> okay. So it's like a damping. Let me put it on a different page. Remember this? Mass. Then you have a damper. We usually call it with a C. In this distance we call X. And C is only active when there's an X dot. Remember? 
sees a damper. So if this thing moves, it is kind of absorbing the energy, and that's kind of the damping. Very similar thing. Think of an airplane. Think of it to attach to an imaginary horizontal line, call this K, call this attached to a damping term, C. And this movement is the pitch rate Q. And the angle, let's say, is alpha. So when I say CM alpha, I'm really talking about the stiffness. When I talk about CMQ, I call about, I'm talking about damping. So what do I mean by when I say damping? I mean when I have this angular velocity, how much moment do I get? It's very similar to this. If I have a velocity x dot, how much force does this damper produce? And if you know from, uh, from dynamics, if you haven't seen it in dynamics, you will see it in vibration, that the dampers, or maybe in system dynamics you might have seen, the dampers, they absorb energy, right? If you don't have a damper, it will just oscillate forever. The damper just absorbs energy. So it's the same thing over here. CMQ. It absorbs, it should absorb energy. How does a damper absorb energy? Do you know how a damper absorbs energy over there? Do you know why we are plotting it like this? A damper really looks like this. I mean the old dampers. There's oil in these things. This is a damper. This is like a piston. Okay? This is a damper. And what happens is, let's say you have fluid over here. Okay? Let's say you have some heavy oil in there. When this is pushed in this direction, the oil, oh, here's my red pen, the oil moves from here to here. But while it's moving, it has really, it's not easy to move because the, 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 the orifices are small. So it is getting compressed. And while it's getting compressed, there's a lot of heat coming out. And it is absorbing, therefore, energy of that, of the kinetic energy that's coming from here, it is absorbed here in, in the form of heat. Because you're pressing that fluid it heats up, so that heat is coming from here. So that, that, that fluid is moving over here. And next time when you're moving in the opposite direction, when you're pulling this thing, now the fluid is moving from this side to the other side. Again doing the same thing, getting compressed, small orifices moves to the other side. Okay? And it heats up again. So when you go left and right with this thing, this is heating up. And a lot of this energy that you push and pull is absorbed in the form of heat from the damper. So if you have a damper over here, so this is this, this is the damper. And that's why we are plotting it like that, because these are all dampers. Okay? Of course you could do this now, you know, modern dampers, they, they have these kind of things. You might have two rubber pieces connect it here, and this one you connect here, and both of them are rubber. And because of the friction, it again has a lot of energy, it, 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 it absorbs energy. And it heats up and everything, but you have to be careful if the rub rubber gets too hot, then it might melt, right? You have to be careful. Even here, you have to, make, you know, you have to cool it down somehow, otherwise it will get too hot. But these are all dampers, and you know, the modern dampers are more sophisticated, of course, but this is why we have a damper that looks like this. It basically absorbs energy. And remember, it, it only produces a force or a resistance when this piston is moving. When it's not moving, it has no force. 
Only when the piston is moving, there is force. So that's not true for the, for the, for the spring. If the spring doesn't move and you pull the spring, it will still pull you back, right? So this one we call stiffness, and this one we call damping. And because it's absorbing energy, it's very important because if you start from somewhere and this starts oscillating, and it will come to a stop, the reason it's coming to a stop is because of the damper. Of course, if you don't have friction. If you have friction, that's again uh, some sort of a damping, right? It will just remove some of the energy. Now here, I have CM alpha, which is the stiffness, but then you have the damping. And the damping would be CM cube. How much moment do I create because of the Q? Now, what sign should CMQ have? What is the sign of CMQ so that it is a proper damping that will absorb energy? What sign should be CMQ? For a positive Q, which direction should be the moment so that it is a proper damping term. For a positive Q, I should have negative moment. For a positive Q, if I have a positive moment, I will have like that. Not good. That's not how a damper works, right? If you push it in one direction, it will try to push you in the other way. So CMQ must really be negative in order to be a pro pro proper damping term. So I don't know if it's like that for my airplane, but if this is like that, then it's good, because then for a positive Q, I have a negative moment. So the faster I go up, the faster I have a moment. If I go slowly up, the moment will be slow. Because of this angle, I have still my CM alpha, which is negative, of course. It will still pull me back. But if I move fast, I have a fast moment down. So, this is what we call a damping term, a damping coefficient. It's a damping coefficient, quite important. Because this tells me if CMQ is a, if the magnitude is large, I mean it's a negative number, but if, if it's large, which means there's a lot of damping. So think of this thing, if there's a lot of damping, what's going to happen? The airplane, if there's a lot of damping in the system, you start the oscillation, the oscillation will die out very quickly because the energy will be absorbed very quickly. If the damping here is low, then it will oscillate a lot, right? Same thing over here. If CMQ, the magnitude is large, what's going to happen is that the airplane is going to oscillate and it will die out very quickly. If CMQ is small, then it will oscillate for a long time. Remember the short period mode and the phygoid mode? This is the one that absorbs the energy. And you're doing this and you do that. That's why it's stable, really. Because if you don't have the damping term, look up here, you will oscillate forever. And if this damping term is small, then you don't know. You oscillate for a long time. More damping means more faster, uh, faster convergence. So you might ask, where is the CMQ physically coming? It is coming because of the air, the aerodynamics. When the airplane is doing this kind of motion, you are pushing the air up and pushing the air down because we are surrounded by the air. Imagine an airplane going up like that. The airplane going up, the air really provides resistance while you're going up. While you're going down, the air will provide you resistance. The faster you go, the more resistance will come from the air. Okay? But if you are up like here, and you don't move, there is no resistance from this air. The resistance is only there when the airplane goes up, there's resistance from the air. So that is the damping. And the damping comes from aerodynamics, it's coming from the air itself. The more Q, the more damping. And because you're moving that air, it's absorbing some of that energy, and it will eventually eat out the energy, and you will go back to your equilibrium point. And this is what we call a damping term, very important term when we look at aerodynamic derivatives. Okay? So, let me tell you another damping term. 
C L P roll damping and this one would be a pitch damping how much rolling moment do I get because of roll rate so if the airplane has a roll rate how much resistance do I get because of the roll rate okay so what is then the yaw damping? Can you tell me the term for yaw damping? C N R. Wonderful. C N R. That's your yaw damping. What sign should be C N R to be a proper damping term? What sign should be CNR so that it's a proper damping term that's good for us? Positive or negative? Let's say this is the airplane. Nose this way. Z body this way. This is a positive R. So for a positive R, I need a negative n. For a negative r, this way, I need a positive n. Because of that r, I need a positive, a negative one. For a negative, I need a positive. Therefore, it should be negative. How about roll damping? Positive or negative? Of course, now it's all, we all know, right? For a positive roll, I want a negative moment. So it should be negative if it's a nice roll damping. Okay? So these are important terms so that the oscillations die out. You know, the figoid mode, the short period mode, the Dutch rolls and all this. We need them so that they die out. So CMQ, CLP, and CNR are the damping terms. Damping, aerodynamic derivatives. And are the important ones. So we have learned, yes sir? Um, if, they are, if these are linear, and that is sometimes not linear, right? I mean, the, the spring coefficient is not linear. It's kx squared. Right? So it's not linear. If this relation is nonlinear, then the relationships will not be equal. Because what we are writing here, CM alpha, by definition, is a linear, is for a linear equation. So this is actually a function CM alpha times alpha will give you that moment. Here it is K times X squared will give you the force. So they are not really equal, but they serve the same idea. Let's put it that way. Okay. So if you, um, um, it depends a little bit on the string as, spring as well. I mean, we always say it's a linear spring which kind of implies that you get a square and stuff like that. So it's nonlinear. Case x square is nonlinear. But we linearized everything. So I, um, there might be people who have tried to find an, an analogous equations. I just uh, didn't come across. But the, men, the idea is the same, you understand? I mean, if you linearize kx square, you will get what? 2k times x or something, right? You still get. Uh, once you linearize this, you might end up with a very similar equation. Any other question? Okay, so let's see if, if my video is still on.
Okay, that's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture. You see a little bit of dihedral, you see? Perfect. Wing is getting perfect clean air. Engines, perfect clean air. Look at the horizontal tail. Perfect clean air. Because the wings are moving the air downwards and this is moving downwards, very clean. Look at the horizontal tail, the vertical tail, very clean. And structurally, wonderful. This is connected to this, this is connected here. These are not on top of this, no oscillations, perfect. Huge wings, two engines, uh, four engines, and landing gears, perfect configuration. You see? see these things? They are there to open up the flaps. You need a lot of force, a lot of hydraulics to open up the flaps because they are producing so much load in terms of drag and lift. So you need these strong hydraulics. Look at the distance of the horizontal tail with the wing, you see? It's not that close. Look at the distance. Pushing down the air and you have still clean air coming from the, from, from the horizontal tail, to the horizontal tail. See the dihedral now? Was something that I could. Sorry. Okay. Look at the horizontal tail. Okay, and you see that round thing here. The horizontal tail can actually move around here. Okay, the whole horizontal tail. This is especially useful if you, you want to trim the aircraft, if you want to fly at a certain altitude. And, uh, and you need a certain horizontal tail position, right? So you set the horizontal tail position. You, can, you could send, uh, set the horizontal tail position to a certain position and say this is a trim position. And from then on, you can give controls. And you can just fix it there because it will be flying at that trim position for a long time. You don't have to, of course, in every airplane, but you could. There was a good question uh, someone asked me during the break. Uh, maybe that's, uh, I have to clarify that too. When the airplane flies forward, the question is, why not just use the vertical tail control to move your nose and make a turn. Well, moving your nose doesn't mean you make a turn. 
moving your nose will, might just mean that you get more side slip, right, with the vertical tail. In order to make that turn, you need a lot of centrifugal for a centripetal force to make that turn. So who's going to provide the centripetal force? Because if I pull on the airplane, then it will turn. If I don't pull on the airplane, it will just go straight. I have to pull on it. If I leave it, it will go straight. I have to pull on it. I always have to pull on it. So who's going to pull on the airplane? When I rotate my nose, there's no force that will pull me. I just rotate my nose and I start flying with a side slip. The biggest force that's out there that I can control is the lift force. So if I tilt the lift force, there will be a component of the lift force that will keep pulling me to the side. Right? And so it's not enough to just rotate my nose. I just get side slip from that. So any questions? So next time you look at airplanes on an airport or on a TV or something, you, I hope you will look at it with a different eye. Okay. And if you see some exotic airplanes, you can immediately say, okay, where is the moment coming from? How does it establish stability? Okay, so that's kind of the end of it. Any questions? No questions? Okay, this is the end of the course. And thank you for coming to class and listening to uh, my lectures. And I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed ex giving the class. So I, uh, I will see you in the finals. And the finals will be similar to the midterms. Okay, maybe a little longer, a little bit more difficult. But overall, it will have the same character. Okay? So, see you in the finals.